everyone. It's uh, Shannon on the program for uh, this Wednesday. Um, it's rare that you get a chance to bring a guy on the program who has um, a level of expertise and um, an experience in more than one sport, uh, at least as a broadcaster. It doesn't happen it used a whole to happen lot all anymore. the time. It used yeah. to happen all the time. You know, when you think about uh, and 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 with the Olympics just finished, it, it, it you 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 would reminisce as a Canadian. You'd you'd see across the country all those great CBC announcers that could do almost everything, and that was yeah. part of their training, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the the Don Whitmans, the Don Chevriers, Ted Reynolds out of Vancouver. There were a, a bunch of guys that, and they had their specialties at the Olympics, but they also did every other sport. And that was the way the CBC system works. So you're right. We don't see that very often. And it's nice to have someone on the show that uh, has a little bit of that background. Uh, Dan Schulman will uh, join us today. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the voices of the Blue Jays on television. And Dan does a boatload of ESPN basketball games, college basketball games. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll delve into both, a little basketball, a little baseball, with uh, Dan Schulman when we come back after these messages. And we're back. It's McCowan. It's uh, Shannon and um, our buddy, our pal, our chum, Dan Schulman, the uh, voice of the Blue Jays, among other things, uh, joins us. Uh, hardest working guy in television. I couldn't, you know, <laughs> I couldn't get him off my TV. He's doing basketball at the Olympics. Uh, you know, I sure the the flight from Tokyo was easy. You know, uh, no, I'm well, just kidding. Well, I know two, you weren't in Tokyo. Uh, yeah, two things, John. I wasn't in Tokyo, and secondly, it's all your fault because you hired me to do the Olympics <laughs> in 1994, and I wanted yeah. to set the record for longest amount of time between working on an Olympics. And I believe I now hold the record at 27 years between working on an Olympics. How was that well, experience? You had, I, I can was I can guarantee you, you had more fun in Norway than you did at the CBC. <laughs> um, the experience was very different than Norway. So, you know, one from we were in Norway for Tokyo, I was on Front Street in, inside the CBC building. But, you know, again, yeah. pandemic and it is what it is. Um, but it was great. One was a Winter Olympics, one was a Summer Olympics. You know, John will remember when he hired me, um, and, and this is not blowing smoke. Uh, I mean, John gave me one of the, the, Shannon gave me one of the biggest breaks of my career. So he hired me to do the Olympics in February of 94, I believe. That's and right. then the world championship of basketball happened to be in Toronto in August of 94. Wow. And he hired me to do both of these things. And it, it was the world championship of basketball that landed me my job at ESPN. That is like, that's is that not right? even a connect the dots thing like that. One thing led to another. Um, I filled in on one baseball game and they said, do you do any other sports? And I said, well, I, I've done some basketball up here. And I sent them to the tape of the world championship, Rick Fox in Canada, losing it in a heartbreaker to Greece. I think it was. And that's right. at the sky dome with all those Greece fans in the 500 level. That's right. Cheering, for, yeah. cheering for their team. And when, yeah. and we want to know where our, our fans that's right. Were. <laughs> and a month later I was working for ESPN. So, um, if, for those who watch me on ESPN and don't like me, Blame that guy. He's 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 part of the reason why I was there. <laughs> I get blame. I get blamed for a lot, Danny. So no, I, I I got thick skin. Don't worry. Well, he hired you repeatedly. He hired me no, never, I... not a single time. <laughs> I, 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 I it had waiting. to be. It turned out to be the reverse. After he got got booted out of producing, oh yeah, I had to give him a job uh, on prime time, and now and now this. Oh. 16 you know, everybody's taking credit for me on prime time now it's unbelievable so well who else is taking credit your uh, david conde uh your buddy millman oh uh, beef fourth all of those guys bite me you know you <laughs> wouldn't have got on there if it wasn't yeah. <laughs> well yeah hey so let's let's get back on on track here uh then new appreciation for uh kevin durant after the olympics uh, I would say even more appreciation. So, I, I mean, he's, you know, unquestionably one of the five greatest players in the world. But I kept thinking, and I said it probably three or four times during the Olympics, you know, even at this level where you've got multiple MVPs and multiple time all-stars, he still separates himself from the rest. And he still is clearly the guy that these other guys, guys like Devin Booker and Damian Lillard, like superstars, they are clearly looking to him to lead the way. And the one game they lost was when Durant was in foul trouble against France in their, in their first game. And I, I might get the numbers a little bit wrong here, but he's won three gold medals and one world cup in the gold medal game of the world cup and the three Olympics. 
he has scored, I believe, 28, 30, 30, and 29 points. Wow. And remember, they're 40-minute games. They're not 48-minute games. So, uh, I mean, he has been the, you know, the superstar of superstars. And uh, you know what I li like about him the most? He keeps coming back for it. It, it just, it's a yeah. passion of his. He doesn't need to do this. He didn't need to go to Tokyo and, and win a third gold medal with nobody in the stands halfway around the world. But he's got a passion for it, and I applaud him for that. Actually, so here, I was surprised to I was surprised to see Holiday. Speaking of guys that didn't have to do it, I was surprised to see Drew Holiday there too. I mean, when you consider uh, after the the run that they went on with the Bucks, well, there were three of them: Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton from the Bucks, right. and Devin Booker from uh, yeah. the Suns. And one of them, I think it was Chris Middleton. Uh, his wife gave birth. I think it was Middleton, not Holiday. His wife gave birth the day after the finals. Then the next day is the parade. Then the next day, Holiday and Middleton get on a plane in Milwaukee, fly to Seattle. Booker gets on a plane in Phoenix, flies to Seattle. And the three of them, three guys who just went tooth and nail in an NBA final series, are on a private plane crossing the ocean together to get to Tokyo. So you, you got to let bygones be bygones quickly. But Drew Holiday, they landed 24 hours before the first game. And Drew Holiday was the second best player the U.S. had in their first game, which is amazing with jet lag and all that. But he he was kind of the sneaky surprise. Like some of the bigger names didn't quite have the, the Olympics that you would think. Like Damian Lillard did not have a great Olympics. And, and Booker was OK. But Drew Holiday might have been the second best player the U.S. had. Well, let's turn back the clock a little bit here. You were talking about Durant. Here's something we really haven't stated in the past or I haven't stated in the past. And I don't know how much conversation there's been about it. But the Raptors championship of a couple of years ago, in my mind, has an asterisk attached to it. And that asterisk relates to the fact that if Kevin Durant had played, the Raptors don't win the NBA championship. You're nodding your head, Shulman. So I yeah. think you, you, you at least acknowledge there's a likelihood of that. Yeah, I mean, Clay Thompson got hurt too, right? right. So yes. like two of the three, you know, they had Steph Curry and they had Draymond Green, but they didn't have the other two guys. And, and I don't put an asterisk beside it. To me, it's kind of like it is what it is and guys get hurt. And, and I get it. You yeah. know, so, but yes, if Durant's healthy, I think the Raptors would have had a hell of a time winning because he, he's absolutely unstoppable offensively. And the Raptors had some guys, Ibaka, Siakam. I, I mean, they had some length and that could contest it, but he's 6'10", and he, his jump shot is released from way up here. Like the next time I see his shot get blocked, I think will be the first time we see his shot get blocked. I, I don't remember it. And, and, you know, again, getting back to Tokyo, um, he was playing against some really good players and they knew exactly what he was going to do. But there were moments where he said, my team needs me to get a bucket now. Right. And it takes some, it, it takes some intestinal fortitude to, you know, to be that guy. That's a hard job. Uh, when everybody is looking at you and you know you got to step up and make a shot, and it seemed like every single time they needed it, he made the shot. Um, since we're on basketball, we'll get to baseball in a second. Um, the observation of most of the Toronto Raptors offseason has been, well, they really haven't done anything, and um, and probably we're going to have a difficult time moving forward, which leaves us in a place where we have to decide whether we're prepared to write off last season as an aberration or accept it as a sign of where they actually are. Where do you sit on that? Well, I, I don't want to pass myself off as an NBA or a Raptor expert because I'm really not. I love basketball, but I'm so immersed in college basketball in the winter that I don't get to watch the NBA as much as I would like. But um, you know, they had a rough season last year, but I think assuming they can come home and assuming they are reasonably healthy, to me, they kind of look like a 500 bunch and we'll have to wait and see what happens with Goran Dragic, obviously. But um, I really, really like Scotty Barnes. I know a lot of people would have loved Jalen Suggs as the pick and Jalen Suggs is going to be a great player. Um, but I, I think Scotty Barnes is terrific. And, and I think their plan is, assuming they keep Siakam, you know, you put Siakam and Ananobi and Barnes on the floor at the same time. And the other team's not going to know who should we guard and who's guarding us. Like there's length all over the floor. Everybody's six, eight, six, nine. They can get after you defensively. What I don't know is who the alpha dog is going to be. I don't think it's Siakam. I think by default, it might have to be Van Vliet. And again, that's a big job. And, and Van Vliet's a fun, you know, his story's phenomenal. What he's accomplished is phenomenal, but can he be a, a lead dog on an NBA team, I think remains to be seen. But I, I think there's enough talent there to be a 500 team. I, I don't think they're going to be also Rams, but I, I don't think they're, you know, I don't think they're contending for the Eastern Conference Finals or anything like that either. So, so 
when they drafted Barnes, you wouldn't have been surprised? No. Uh, well, I will tell you because I did some radio hits on this and I saw a lot of Jalen Suggs and a lot of Scotty Barnes. And so when I would go on the fan, I would get asked about it and I would say, I can't talk about Kaminga and like the guys who played in the G League Ignite or whatever they play, but the college guys I know. And I said, if it's me, I'm taking Suggs. But I, um, but I would tell you, I love Scotty Barnes. Love, love, love. In, in 26 years of doing college basketball, I'm not sure I have covered a guy whose energy and uh, abilities as a teammate and intangibles like leap off the screen like those of Scotty Barnes do. Um, because it was a pandemic year, never got face-to-face -face talking to Scotty Barnes, but Zoom called with his coach a bunch for games I did, Florida State games, I did a bunch of them. Um, he can rebound, he can guard one through four, maybe five. He's a great passer. He can bring the ball up the floor. He doesn't have a great jump shot. If you try and pigeonhole him into he's a this, uh, I don't think it works. He's just a basketball player and they'll figure out how best to use him. And if, if, if he turns into what I think he turns into, even this year, I think you're going to have games, lots of them, where Scotty Barnes has 15 points, seven rebounds, six assists, two blocks and three steals. I think he's that kind of guy, a little bit of everything. Um, so in, in all the conversations in the interviews that I had on the fan, when I was asked, I, I would say, if it's me, Suggs, but my second choice would be Barnes. I, I'm, um, I, I was on team Suggs and I was on team Barnes. Suggs is going to be a force of nature, I believe. He, you know, he was a phenomenal football player in high school too, not just a basketball player. And he plays basketball with a football player's intensity. And he can get down the floor in a heartbeat and like just dunk over you and embarrass you and he can shoot threes. And, and I don't know, I suspect the reason they took Barnes is the length and the defensive versatility. I think that's the way they want to go. We all know the Raptors love uh, positional versatility in defense. And, and Barnes brings more of that than Suggs does. Uh, uh, Suggs does. I think Suggs is going to electrify a little bit more and he's going to have more 25 point games. But I, uh, and again, I think I would have taken Suggs, but I, I had Barnes like right there with him uh, for the fourth pick. Well, did you happen to watch uh, the first game the Raptors um, team played in the uh, summer league? I did not, but I saw, I saw highlights and I saw the box score and that was pretty, that's a pretty good start. Yeah. And he made some shots and he made yeah. some threes. And, um, you know, we'd all heard the same thing that you, you said that the, the missing ingredient or the weakest part of his game right now to now is a shot. Really that looked mitigated. The impact of that looked mitigated in the first game. You, you know what? Um, I don't think you can coach guys to be, to work that much harder or to be that much better of a person or the, you know, there are some things you are what you are you can get better as a shooter. There are, yep, you can teach him to shoot. Power. Yeah. There are hundreds of guys who came into the NBA as so, so shooters and turned out much, much better um, by the end of their career. Like Jonas Valanciunas, for God's sake, like he started shooting threes and Brooke Lopez started shooting three big guys who had never done this before in their life. I, I, I don't think he's ever going to be Ray Allen or anything like that, but he'll, no. he'll be competent. And again, he, he does so many other things. He's a winning ball player. He, he's a basketball player who makes his teammates better and helps you win games and, and at both ends of the floor. You sound change. like a scout for the Sixers when they took Ben Simmons out of LSU. Uh, yeah, not so on somebody team could teach him to shoot. No, <laughs> no, no. Never, never been on team Simmons. Ne never no. have been on. No, he does <laughs> not have that positive energy. Ben, so Ben Simmons shot coming out of college was nowhere near where Scotty Barnes shot was uh, like right. Ben Simmons shot is a problem. And and also, again, like the first thing I said about Barnes, as you, as you guys remember, is in the 26 years I've done this, I've never seen a guy whose intangibles leap off the screen. I don't, I don't see that in Ben Simmons. I, I, I see it in Scotty Barnes. Ben Simmons is a wonderful talent. He's an incredibly talented player. And I did some of his games and I spoke to him face to face a couple of times. And I remember thinking he's going to put up numbers, but I don't know if he's going to win. And, um, you know, when I think of Scotty Barnes, I think, He's going to win. Uh, th that's what I think of when I think of Scotty Barnes. Is he lazy? Who? Simmons? Simmons. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. I, I'm not close enough to this. Well, issue. and I asked that, Danny, simply because it's hard to explain how a guy can be in the NBA for four or five years and his shot really is no better uh, yeah. other than he, he, he's just not willing to work at it. Yeah. So, you know, so some guys, and, and I'm sure, you know, you found this in golf, uh, Bob, and we, you know, you find it in all walks of life. Some guys work on what they're good at. Some guys work at, some people work at what they're good at. Some people work at what needs work. The smarter people are the people who work at what needs work. And, and I think Scotty well Barnes is going to work at what needs work. So, 
Um, it, it does amaze me that Simmons can't get the shot a little bit better. It's funny too, because, you know, I didn't know him as a 14 year old or anything. I met him as when he was an 18 year old or 19, whatever he was. But I would think by the time he was 14, it was obvious he had a future in basketball, but that that was going to be a problem. And, and yeah. the longer you wait, the harder it is to fix, whether it's a baseball swing or a golf swing or your shot in basketball. So um, I, I don't know. I, I'm very curious if they move him, where they move him, and what the other team sees uh, if they acquire him, because uh, he's a great talent. But but again, I, I think there there are some complications with him. Uh, let's move on to um, baseball. We have all been around long enough to understand that uh, one win, one loss doesn't mean anything and that it, it is a long grind. And one of the things that I constantly remind people of is that, you know, if you want to be a great football team, you probably have to win 90% of your games. If you want to be a great basketball or hockey team, you have to win probably 80% of your games. Baseball, you win 65% of your games. You're yep. a great team. Yeah. And you're absolutely going to a championship or going to a playoff. And then you see what happens. Um, and I guess the reason for that is the length of the season. I can't imagine it's anything else. Or maybe it's in part just the nature of the game. You know, trying to hit a round thing with a round thing is not an, an easy task. Having said that, this Toronto Blue Jay team has shown some signs over the last... 14, 15 games of being pretty good. Mm -hmm. In fact, better than pretty good, real good. And yet in the back of, I think all of our minds is how long is this sustainable? Can this be another 2015 kind of run or are those kind of once in a lifetime? What's your best guess? My best guess is it's going right down to, to the final weekend. So um, let's concede the West to Houston. Let's concede the Central to the White Sox. Let's, let's concede the East to the Rays. Maybe we shouldn't, but uh, I think the Jays are seven and a half back or something right. like that. So yeah. if that's the case, you've got the Red Sox, Yankees, Blue Jays, and Oakland for two spots. I believe the Blue Jays are the most talented of those four teams. Uh, but they've also got to leapfrog a couple of them to get into the playoffs. Now, that only means picking up about three games with 51 or whatever it is to go. That's doable. Um, I think the offense is going to hit. And I think the starting rotation that they have managed to put together, every single one of us would have said at the beginning of the year, the starting rotation is the biggest concern this team has. You're right. And the starting rotation has been, generally speaking, not good, but great the last yeah. several weeks. Right. Robbie Ray is pitching at an all star level. Hyunjin Ryu hasn't been as good as last year, but he's still pretty good. Uh, Jose Barrios is a, obviously a terrific pickup. And Alec Mano has got a 250, as we speak here, he has a 250 ADRA through his first 10 major league starts. And then it looks like Steven Matz will be the fifth because Ross Stripling came up with an injury in his most recent outing. So um, I think it's up to the bullpen. Like even, you know, as we talk here on Wednesday, on Tuesday night, Stripling had to leave after two innings. They were lucky it was a seven inning game, double header. They got two out of Richards, two out of Simber, and one out of Romano, with Romano giving up two hits and a walk to bring Otani to the plate as the tying run. But he struck him out. It's great. They win the game. Now, uh, there's another game coming tonight. And if they have a one-run lead at the end of six innings, I'm not sure who's coming out of the bullpen for seven, eight, nine, because I don't think Richards can, and I don't think Romano can. I think Simber could probably give him an inning, but that still means that Patrick Murphy or... Rafael Dolis or Brad Hand is going to have to get them some big outs. Now, you can mitigate that risk by scoring 12 runs. And then, mm -hmm. you know, if you blow the other team out, then you don't have to worry about it. But I still think they have questions in the bullpen. And whether it's Stripling moving there, Pearson coming up, Mesa getting healthy, Barucky figuring it out, Merriweather reappearing. Like, there are a lot of possibilities, but there's very little certainty. Um, so I would still be concerned about the bullpen. I think they're good enough to take this right down to the wire, but I think the bullpen is going to be the tipping point for that. Is there any chance Nate Pearson shows up in the bullpen at some point? Yes, but yes, that is the plan right now. We were told a couple of days ago, he came down with an illness, non COVID. And that was a bit of a setback. He had pitched once or twice in Florida. He is supposed to pitch in the next few days in Buffalo. Um, which is great. But as I tell people, so, okay, step one, is he healthy? Step two, can he pitch well enough at AAA 
to warrant getting called up. Step three is, can you put him in in low leverage situations in the majors? And he does well. And then step four is, can he help you in high leverage situations? And as talented as he is, I don't know that you can skip steps right now. There have been a lot of setbacks. This hasn't gone the way that it's supposed to go, that it was supposed to go. Um, you know, if we, fa if we uh, sorry, rewind six months, say it's the first day of spring training, the blueprint for the rotation had Nate Pearson as the number two starter behind Hyunjin yes, Ryu, and, and like number two. And, mm -hmm. and that just never got going. Uh, I've always kind of felt he might be better suited as a reliever, given what I've seen of him, which granted isn't a lot, but I've seen every major league inning that he's thrown, but it's just not that many. You know, he's been hurt a lot. Uh, he had, you know, that one outing he had earlier this year against Houston, he had serious control issues. Uh, he's never had that in the minors. He's had that at times in the majors. So I think it, it, he could be a real weapon, but to just say, you know, with 100% certainty, he's going to be the guy. I, I don't think you know that, but he's certainly going to be given the opportunity. On uh, every team that I can remember, there is a guy in the bullpen that I don't trust. <laughs> There's a guy that when he gets the call from the manager to come in, I go, oh, crap. Yeah. Uh, who's that guy for you on this team? With due <laughs> respect. You know, it's funny. Um, Rafael Dolis who was, has been really good at times for this team over the last two years, cheap too, like really good and really cheap, but you know, his highs have been pretty high, but boy, he can, he can mix in a low with the best of them sometimes. Right. And, and he, pitched, that's I mine, it, Danny, part of me, you hit it, 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 the nail on the head. It's no least. Yeah, it, it's him. The funny thing is he came into the game. When was the last time he pitched Sunday against the Red Sox? I think Saturday, Sunday. And he came into that game uh, no, I'm sorry. It was the first game of the game one of the double header. Yeah. First game of the double header last night. Forgive me. Yeah, I'm still nice on day. Tokyo time or something. And he came into that game with nine consecutive scoreless appearances. You could have won the biggest bar bet in the world on that. If you nobody had walked into the bar and said, who thinks you know, nobody would have believed it. People would have said he's been terrible. Nine consecutive scoreless appearances. And then last night didn't go well. Right. It was a, was a problem in game one of the double header. Sorry, my wife is printing something uh, quite all right. <laughs> from downstairs. She is. Uh, so uh, if you hear that in the background, so I, I would say it's Dolis. Um, and the issue is because he's quote done it before, if they need a guy who's outside the circle of trust, he might be the guy they throw into the circle of trust to try to get the big outs. You know, he's going to get a chance ahead of Kirby Sneed or something like that to get big outs. But with me, it's still least because you just don't seem to know what you're going to get from uh, outing to outing. Let me just Is there... clarify something real quickly here. You said he's got, he went, had gone nine consecutive outings without giving up a run. I assume that you mean an earned run, a run charged to him. Correct. Like if he lets in somebody else's runs, I, that doesn't count. Like if you were just to look at his game log, you would get nine consecutive zeros and, right. and he had pitched better and he had been pitching in lower level, uh, lower leverage situations because they've got other guys. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if a Pearson or a Merriweather or a Soria or a Mesa don't make it back, then Dolis is number four or five instead of being number seven or eight on the depth chart. And, yeah. and that gets, you know, again, because there's, there's so much uh, variation between his good and his bad, you never know what you're going to get sometimes. What, what, what's the explanation for inconsistency for Berecki then? <sighs> You know, that that's that's one I struggle with sometimes because he came up and looked like he was going to be a plus starting pitcher, starting mm -hmm. pitcher for the Blue Jays. Now, he's had major elbow injuries two, maybe three times, I think, in his career. And they moved him to the bullpen and he embraced it right away last year. And and he had some great moments, too. And I will I will tell you that I'm a huge fan of his as a person. I've gotten to know him reasonably well. And he's like, you know, if you're going to have a 26 year old son like you know, he's at the top of the list. He's great. Um, what, what I've seen is his command has been hot and cold. His stuff is good enough to get swings and misses, but if he's falling behind two and oh, three and one all the time, you just, and, and Dolis has this too. Uh, and Robbie Ray had it before he figured it out. You know, that's when the, the solo homer becomes a three run homer because you've walked a couple of guys, you just can't do it. So he's got to throw strikes. And, and I also think the three batter rule has hurt him a little bit. And it's funny because he used to be a starter, but he, to me, he looks like he struggles against righties. Um, his third pitch is his changeup, and he just doesn't seem quite confident enough in it to throw it 
uh, as much as he could. Um, you know, if you're Robbie Ray, you can get by with fastball slider 96% of the time between those two pitches. Most guys need a third pitch, in my opinion, even if you're a reliever. Before the three batter rule, you could spot Barucki against two lefties and get him out of there. But now it might be lefty, righty, righty, lefty, something like that. Teams are setting up their lineups to make it harder. So uh, I think he needs more confidence in his changeup. And I, and, and I think he needs to throw more strikes with his fastball and his slider. Well, I have a slightly different theory, and it's not necessarily about Barucki because I really don't know the answer to that. But, but here's what I think, Danny, that if you're a starter, mentally, in, in, somewhere in your brain, you're pacing yourself. You're understanding, I'm going to want to throw 90, 100, 110 pitches in this game. I'm not going to throw my fastball as hard as I can throw it for as long as I can throw it. If you're a reliever, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to probably throw 20, 25 pitches in this appearance. I'm going to throw as hard as I can. Yep. Do you think that's a factor? I think it can be because sometimes you sacrifice control for velocity. But I would think, you know, he had some success, not months of success, but weeks of success last year in his first year in the bullpen. So I would think by now um, that he would be okay with it. And, and I'm a little bit surprised. I, I thought because he emotionally embraced the role and he did, he didn't, you know, he didn't struggle with it. He, he said, I get it and I love it. And I love the guys down here and the adrenaline rush is great and all that. Um, I, I thought he would take off. Uh, I, I really did, but, um, yeah, there may be something to that. And if he backs off a little bit for command, but you know, velocity is such a, uh, everybody's chasing velocity. Everybody is chasing. Sure they are. I mean, we all went to baseball games before there were radar guns on the scoreboard. We did all we knew was Nolan Ryan threw hard and doc Gooden threw hard. Right. That's all we knew. Right. <laughs> we, we didn't know 94 from 97. Now everybody knows instantly what everybody throws on my computer when I'm calling a game I can look and within a half second I see it to the tenth of a mile so I can see uh oh he went from 95.6 to 94.8 I can see that within two seconds and and uh, I don't know if he's chasing velocity or not it, it, it's an interesting point it, it's it's possible I hope he's healthy uh, because I do believe he's got the stuff to be a, a successful major league pitcher I, By the I way, we're all old. We're all old enough to think that remember when Tommy John was actually a pitcher, not a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's true. So I was going to go down that road. Um, there was a guy in 1977, the first year of the Toronto Blue Jays. You guys will remember, I assume, um, who won, went five and zero oh at the beginning of his major league career for the Toronto Blue Jerry Jays. Jerry Garvin, right? Jerry Garvin. Jerry Garvin. Yeah. And um, I swear, he never threw a fastball over 75 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it would be interesting if Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin were 18 years old today. Yeah. What They'd never they... make it to the major leagues because right. they'd have put the gun on them and they said, right. you got no chance. Right. Um, you know, even if Mark Burley were 18 years old today, Same thing. What, what, would, what would the scouts think of them? Um, you know, pitchers have never thrown harder than they do now. They've never gotten hurt more than they do. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's a very, very different game than it was in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, a bunch more to talk about. Let's take a quick break and come back with more. Dan Schulman is with us back after these messages. McCowan and Shannon and uh, Dan Schulman, the voice of the uh, Blue Jays, among other things. Um, one of the issues that hasn't been discussed much, and I don't know whether it will or whether it even should be, but I'm going to mention it here. We are going through the starting rotation. Manoa is one of those guys who has thrown very few innings um, as a professional. And, of course, as an amateur, less in all likelihood. Is there going to come a time at any point over the next um, 60 days or less, 45 days, when we wonder whether Manoa needs a night off or a break or has he thrown too much? Is that being discussed at all? Do you know? Uh, I don't know if it has. It, it seems to me like he kind of is an exception to the rule. Like he's such a big, strong horse that I think they're okay with it. And I don't remember the exact number his last year at West Virginia. And then he gets drafted and he makes five or six starts in Vancouver for the Blue Jays organization. I think he threw 120, 130 innings, something like that. So he's done that before. Um, I don't think they're going to skip him. Um, 
you know, they've got some off days down the stretch, so you can push them back a day here or there. But I think they're pretty comfortable with it. But it's a good question. It's one I, I tell you what, I will look into it and, and see if I can get a straight answer, although you don't always get straight answers to straight questions. And, and I understand the team not wanting to give away that kind of information. But I've wondered, say this team makes the playoffs. Right. Uh, what a weapon he could be out of the bullpen in the playoffs if you shorten your rotation. And that's not, you know, he deserves to be in there. But, you know, Ryu and Barrios and Ray are clearly going to be starting pitchers in the playoffs Agreed. if they get there, right? So the issue is, do they have a three-man rotation or a four-man rotation? It might depend on the off days and all that. But, you know, what if you paired up you could pair him up with somebody. What if Steven Matt started and then the fourth inning Manoa came in and you turned some guys around and forced the other team to, to pinch hitting. Or if, if the bullpen is an issue, then imagine bringing that guy, you know, Robbie Ray goes six and imagine bringing Manoa out for two innings when nobody else is available to get to Romano or something like that. I, I'm not saying they're going to do it. I'm just saying I, I could envision like, imagine the bullpen door opening and, and, you know, six, six, two sixty. Uh, Alec Manoa running in and, and just giving it all he's got. It, it, it would be an interesting dynamic in, in the postseason. Well, and you can hearken back, you'll recall, to the early 90s when the Blue Jays used guys like Key and Stottlemyre and Wells yeah. all out of the bullpen. Yeah. Henkin, too, um, I think, uh, when he came and up. And Henkin, yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it happens. And, and you know, the analytics right now, everybody's afraid of third time through the order and that sort of thing. So, listen, we've seen Blake Snell come out of the game in the – what he did to the Blue Jays, I think he allowed one hit and they took him out. They let him face Biggio as the leadoff hitter in the playoffs last year. And then they took him out. He faced 19 batters. They did not let him face Bichette, Guerrero, Grichik, Teoscar uh, third time around. We saw it in the World Series with the Rays and it cost them. We saw, was it Matt Shoemaker and Robbie Ray kind of get paired up, right? Shoemaker went three innings and then Robbie Ray came in. So the way we think about conventional pitching, like that's, that's gone. If we don't want to sound like uh, like old men, we need to understand that anything is on the table, uh, especially in the playoffs in a small sample size. Speaking of speaking of, of non conventional, uh, I know they're thinking of going back to the or they're going to go back to the nine inning doubleheader if they play doubleheaders. But I really liked yesterday. I liked the two seven inning games. I thought it was fun to watch, and it wasn't too long. I don't know what you thought. Um. Can I agree with you 110% on that? Can I go over a hundred? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm with you. I think it brings, listen, I remember as a kid and uh, you guys will understand all this. So I lived up in Willowdale and I'd get on the 53, but the 53, I'd bust to Finch station. I'd take the subway to King and I'd take the streetcar to the X because back in those days, there were doubleheader scheduled before the season began, right? You yeah. could, mm -hmm. you knew in March, there was a doubleheader in July. And on yeah. Saturday or Sunday, you'd go down and see the Red Sox or the Tigers or what. And, and that's great for a kid, but they don't do that anymore. Doubleheaders are only because of weather issues right now. And they're tougher to schedule. And 18 in innings of baseball is, is a lot. And it's hard to cover your, it's hard to have enough pitching to get through 18 innings of baseball. I, um, I like to think I'm a traditionalist. Maybe I'm fooling myself, but I love the seven inning double headers. I think it brings some urgency and excitement to each game. Like all of a sudden you say it's the fifth inning. And then you look at the bullpen and the eighth inning, the quote unquote eighth inning guys getting up in the bullpen right now. Cause you're, you're getting near the end of the game. And I'll tell you this, I have yet to talk to a player who doesn't like them. Um, you know, they're, because you need more pitchers, you have fewer bench players. Because you have fewer bench players, more guys are playing both ends of a doubleheader. Like teams only have a three-man bench right now. So that means six of the nine regulars have to play both ends of the doubleheader. Um, I think there are a lot of good reasons to keep them. And, and I know it's, you know, maybe it's not the how I should feel about it, but I'm, I'm all in favor of keeping the seven-inning doubleheaders. Well, a couple things come to mind here. Number one, it's a misnomer to call these doubleheaders because they aren't really doubleheaders. They are split doubleheaders is what they used to call them. And it's done out of greed, lust, and pestilence because they want to they kick the, the crowd out from the first game and bring in a new crowd and a new bunch of paying customers for the second game. Well, I, I get the greed beyond. and lust, but I, I, don't, I don't see pestilence. I see greed and lust. I understand. Well, all right. Uh, so I'll take pestilence out just to make you happy. Actually, pestilence, pestilence I think he's coming in in the seventh inning. So okay. <laughs> well, not, not in a seven inning doubleheader. Well, maybe he is. 
The <laughs> second thing is that people think that this is such a great evolution. Young people think, oh, like, well, they made no, this no. change from seven. I used to go to Maple Leaf oh. Stadium in the 1960s sure. to watch the Toronto Maple Leafs play. And every Sunday, they had a doubleheader. This is the International League. Every Sunday was a doubleheader. And because of because it was Sunday and we had these laws where, you know, bars couldn't be open and this couldn't be done. And you the game had to end by six o'clock. So they played seven inning double headers. Yeah. Back then. But they were real double headers, Danny. They were right. not like three o'clock, seven o'clock starts, clear all the other people out and bring the new right. crew in. Right. You know, you got to sit there and watch two games. Yeah. Sparky Anderson playing second base for the Toronto right. Blue Jays yeah. or for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. Um, so it's not really evolutionary, by the way. But what well, no, but that was that was a fact of life in uh, AAA baseball was the seven inning doubleheader. Sure, they, they were all over. We used to, the PCL, the Vancouver Mounties played seven inning baseball yeah. games like that too. Was, yeah. That was that was and that was all for travel and for roster sizes, the whole thing. Everything everything revolved around having if you had to have a doubleheader for weather. You were uh, you were you were playing seven innings in AAA baseball. You know what, too, though, it's tough to keep people's attention, and there are infinitely more options now than there were back then. And uh, I, I think also you got a better chance of keeping people's attention with fourteen innings rather than eighteen innings. Oh, I it? agree. Yeah, so I, I I agree, but but it brings me to the other point, and that is this tenth inning put a runner on second base stuff. I mean, I guess that's part of the game we're not going to see change now too, and. You know, maybe I'm nuts because I spent a lot of time sitting in the concrete convertible press box watching 15, 17, 19 inning baseball games. And yeah, we bitched and complained about, you know, how it was ruining our lives or at least that <laughs> night. But the truth is you remember those days. Yeah. You remember those games. I remember fog at the old exhibition stadium that delayed the start of games till 1030 at night. And then they went into extra innings. And I think they had a one o'clock curfew and then couldn't start after one o'clock, but I'm not even positive of that. But that's, you know, I don't know. No, I kind of mixed emotions. Well, the, but the, the, the issue, and I mean, after, after Dan's done the 40 minute basketball games and we watched the, the women's soccer game at the Olympics is that baseball has the biggest issue with length of games and of any sport oh, we, right oh, I, that's, I that's the that. issue that's that is that is the biggest issue we you know people and, and that's one of the reasons why there are other sports are trying to get to the two-hour window how do you keep the game to two hours that's the magic baseball's what is it now baseball's at three hours they're about 310 308 something wow. like that average so I mean, that's like get, those are cricket times yeah. those are cricket times. when you get into those long games and i think 19 is the longest i've ever called so if the game starts at seven and you're in the 18th inning it's well past midnight if you had twenty five thousand in the ballpark at the beginning you might have two thousand uh, in the 18th mm -hmm. inning and i'm sure the tv audience is a sliver of what it was and 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 again, I think part of this, too, is the health of, of the pitchers. I, I think they're concerned about that and, and making a mockery of the game. Like I did a Canada Day game back in 16 or 17, and Ryan Goins and Darwin Barney both pitched in the game for the Blue Jays, and I think they both got hurt. First, I know one of them got hurt. Barney got hurt. I, I, I can't remember if Goins got hurt. And I think Cleveland won the game. Uh, if it were me, I, I would, if, if anybody cared what I thought, I, I would suggest maybe a hybrid, like, the 10th and 11th innings you play normal, but if you get to the 12th, then you start with a man runner at second or something like that. Like I, I'm with you, Bob, we remember them and there's a sense of adventure. And at some point you say, well, hell let's break a record. Let's play forever. But I, I don't know how many people are really, I don't know how many people that really serves to be honest with you, whether it's the players or, or the, the fans or the viewers. Oh, I get it. I'm just the old man on the porch, you know, uh, <laughs> yelling, get off my lawn. Yeah. I mean, I get that. Um, and yet we all have, we have a long history of watching the game and their baseball is about institution. It is, it is a sport that changes the least in terms of rules and regulations. And over the course of a season, and I know that this doesn't come up all that often. I don't know how many seven inning games the Blue Jays are going to wind up playing, but how many at bats are taken away? Um, how do the statistics compare to previous years? Um, and if you, like, we, we were talking about the possibility of, well, or at least John kind of implied 
maybe you get to a point in this in this sport where a regular game is seven innings. Forget double headers, a regular game is seven innings. I, I don't think they could get that one through the CBA personally, but why the players the wouldn't like it? I think the players I don't would think love the play- it. Well, no, because what about all your bonuses? What about all your stats? What well, about it all, all have to be adjusted, stuff? I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, I, I don't mean, think we I don't think we ever get there. The Blue Jays have played seven doubleheaders this year, which it feels like a lot. I, I bet you they've played more than most, right? If, if their home games are in Toronto, they wouldn't have played seven doubleheaders. They had rain issues in Dunedin and Buffalo. So right. seven doubleheaders means 14 shortened games and two innings per shortened game. So you're losing a total of 28 innings of baseball is is what you're losing over the course of the season guys might lose 20 at bats or something or not even that 15 at bats over yeah. the over the course of a season and that's for a team that's played a lot of double headers so um you know teams are so focused on rest and recovery and getting into the next city at a decent hour and you know w- we watched cal ripken play 2632 consecutive games like that sounds like insane talk right now you know guy guys are their guys are being given a rest because they're monitoring them and and they can tell when they're fatigued and at risk of injury um and again anything they can do to get them more rest and and uh, whether it's right or wrong i don't know but it, it kind of feels like common sense and and i hope they keep them i don't think they're going to though i think they're going back to nine but i i right. kind of hope they keep the seven uh before we let you go uh junior's been in a bit of a slump uh, of late his batting yeah. average has dropped by about 20 points and i know nobody wants the the younger set doesn't want to even acknowledge that that's a statistic worth looking at but it does tell you something but have you seen anything in him do you think he's tired i i think they're all a little tired to be honest with you so this is vladimir guerrero juniors and Bo bichette's first 162 game season that's right vladdy came up in may of 2019 um, the AAA, he started in AAA, which started a little bit li- uh, uh, later than the majors did. Like he's never played more than say 140 games in a season. Bo's never played more than about 125, 130 games in a season. Um, and and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're a little bit banged up uh, and, and a little bit tired. Um, and, and actually last week when I was on the field for the KC series, um, saw Bo and pull and chatted with him for a minute. And he said, you know, he said, it's funny uh, people on the one hand, I'm supposed to be like a veteran, but I've never even played 162. He, I mean, he's 23 years old and Vlad yep. 22 years old. So um, I, I would imagine that everybody's a little bit tired. I, I also think I, I, that they're pitching him a little bit differently, pitching him a little bit better. Um, he's gotten out of his game plan. He's he's chased some pitches that he wasn't chasing earlier in the season. I, I think he's going to be fine. But I've always believed that that first wire to wire major league season is a major adjustment for young players. So on the one hand, we can say, well, it's his third year, but it's really not. And 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 you know, again, it's because of the the pandemic. And I think these off days the Blue Jays have coming up next week and into September are going to be very important. And the way they use the DH spot is going to be very important because uh, they need those two, the, you know, they're two young players, but they're two of their most important players and they need them as fresh as can be. Uh, MVP, Otani or Guerrero? I think right now it's Otani. Now, if Laddie heats up again, I think he's got a great chance. If the Blue Jays make the playoffs and the Angels don't, I think laddie has got a great chance. But if the season were to end today, with the numbers that they have and the Blue Jays not in the playoffs, uh, I think it would be Otani. I think a lot of writers are now conditioned to look at, um, you know, analytics, war, some of the some of the newer stats. And I think Otani, I, I haven't looked at it that recently, but I think Otani's pitching numbers push him over the edge. You know, he's hit more home runs than Vladdy. His OPS is almost the same as Vladdy's because, as Bob said, you know, Vladdy's cooled off recently. A month ago, I would have said Vladdy because he was, or two weeks ago, whatever, he was still on fire. Um, but I, I, I would have Otani slightly in front right now, but I, I certainly think there's enough time left for Vladdy to overtake him. I agree hundred percent with that. Um, in all, in all aspects, listen, we'll let you go. Uh, you got a baseball game and, uh, we'll, uh, or a basketball game or both or, or something. I don't know, yeah. something, uh, always our pleasure. We thank you very much, Danny, and, uh, look forward to chatting down the road sometime. Thanks. Absolutely. Pal. Thanks guys. Good to see you. Dan Schulman back after these messages. So once again, our thanks to Danny for uh, joining us, Dan Shulman. Um, Blue Jays split the doubleheader last night, losing 6-3 in the opener, winning 4-0 in the, uh, in the nightcap. 
And um, they've played very well the last two weeks. They played especially well and kind of, I think they won a game on the road before they came back home, but that 11 game homestand was really kind of the, the, um, the impetus for um, a, a, a better performance. What is it? How much do you think it was the home field? Oh, I, I, I think there, even that subconscious, I'm not living out of a suitcase. I'm in, I'm in my own condo or my own house. I assume condo more than anything. I think that's or still hotel. They might a lot of them might still be in a hotel. Yeah, room. yeah. The, you know, it's, it's funny. Dan mentioned the you know the guys like Guerrero and and Bichette uh, and even Biggio. They haven't played those 162 game seasons yet, but they've also played in three ho- different home stadiums. How much of a how much of a roller coaster has that been? When you think that their season started in Dunedin, it went to Buffalo, and now finally at home. That that has to at some point you have to wonder if they will hit a wall uh, from that perspective. And Danny just said he thinks they're a little tired. Well, it is, um, it is the middle of August. Uh, and um, there is that saying, you know, um, August is the, uh, the dog days of the baseball season. Yeah. And once you get to September, I think your motor gets going a little bit bit more it's not that you're less tired but your adrenaline is is pumped up a little bit for a variety of reasons even when you're not in a pennant race maybe you're fighting for a job or a new contract or whatever uh but you got to get through august and so far the blue jays have done a good job getting through august well and i i think what you know they think after the trade deadline the concept was you know keep get keep us in the game until it until they can get to september yeah and it's gone from four and a half games back of a of a, a wild card position to now two and a half and that's uh, that's big that's that they've done they've done exactly what they needed to do to stay in contention and and you would acknowledge too that um the task hasn't been made easier by the fact that the Yankees and the A's have both been almost as hot as the blue Jays or as hot over that period of time. Yeah. The Red Sox are the one team that has floundered and we waited for this for a long time. I think everybody, my I, I, I certainly was one of those who said, this is a mirage. This Red Sox team is not this good and they're going to come back down to earth and they're, they're crashing back to earth. Well, when you think about uh, everybody in the AL East beefing up at the deadline, what did Boston do? Tampa did something. Yankees did something. Jays did something. How much did Boston change? Well, I probably wouldn't have changed anything because if I was them, I would have realized, you know, it's a miracle if we win this division. It might still it, it'd be close to a miracle if they make the playoffs. Um, I think they're one of the odd, te- the, uh, odd guys out. And the, You do, huh? Yeah, I do. And it remains to be seen whether... Oakland, New York, or the Blue Jays, in all likelihood. Um, which of those is the other one? Uh, we will uh, we'll take a pause uh, until tomorrow and uh, come back with a, another program for your listening or viewing enjoyment, we hope. Uh, for Shannon McCowan, we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.